Explain to us these budding therapies and how much more you think you can sell them. So nice to be with you, Bonnie. Yeah, so we think that we had a good and very resilient uh, first half of the year. Of course, we were challenged by the COVID-19 pandemic all over the world, but our manufacturing operation really stayed on top of the game, and we were able to keep on uninterrupted supplying people all over the world. And as you know, we are the largest uh, fact factor in pharmaceutical manufacturing worldwide, supplying around 200 million patients every day. So we were happy about that, and we were also happy about the progress on our new products that we've launched recently. So Ostedo, which is used in Huntington's disease and in tardive dyskinesia, and also a Joey, which is used in migraine. And in both of these products, we saw a nice growth. So we see a good combination of a resilient value chain in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic and some strong growth from our new products. So it was, a, I think, a good quarter in that sense, uh, despite the fact that we do see lower volumes due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes, and of course, we should also mention that you're sort of coming towards the end of your two-year restructuring plan too, so this is all coming at you at once. Now, you had said that stockpiling had pulled some sales forward and that that would have hurt sales a little bit this quarter. Do you continue expecting that in, in coming quarters, or are we through the most of that now? I think we're through the most of it. What we really saw was that in the end of the first quarter in Europe, where we were facing the lockdowns, we had patient hoarding at the pharmacy level of both OTC products and generics to the tune of roughly 200 million. Now, this 200 million resulted in extraordinary high sales in Europe in the first quarter. It then came back as a reduction in sales in the second quarter. So if you even it out, actually sales were pretty steady. The reason why sales went down in the second quarter was, of course, both because people had stockpiled at home, but also because they stopped going to the pharmacy, they stopped going to the doctor and the hospital during the lockdowns. Now the lockdowns are basically over in Europe, and we see that volumes are getting back towards normal. I would say right now they're probably maybe 5 to 10 percent below normal, but we see signs that some markets are getting all the way back to normal. What will happen in the third and fourth quarter depends on how the pandemic evolves. And it's difficult to say right now. Our expectation is that we'll get close to normal, but we have also contingency plans so that we can hit our targets should we see some marginal reduction in overall volume in Q3 and Q4 this year. And you're still targeting margins up to 28% by 2023? Yes, there's no change to our long-term financial targets. We're targeting, as you said, operating market uh, operating margin of 28 percent we're targeting to get the net the dead net debt down so we have a target of net debt to EBITDA ratio which should go below three at the end of 2023 and all those targets remain unchanged now core the opioid suits obviously you're dependent along with the likes of JNJ endo and more can you tell us where you are in negotiations there you had put aside 1.2 billion dollars but where are the negotiations? So I would say the negotiations are quite progressed in this form that we created a framework settlement together with the AGs last year, together with Johnson & Johnson and three big distributors. Now, this framework has really been sort of refined during the latest months, but we have not seen, you could say, the last push to the finishing line. And uh, the reason is really COVID-19, because we were all expecting that the trial, the opioid trial in New York, in February would push us to that finishing line and we would get the whole thing signed and sealed. But then uh, COVID-19 happened and the trial got postponed and is still postponed. And there's really no clarity on when we'll see the next major opioid litigation ha actually happening on the ground here in the US. And as long as it doesn't happen, we don't really see all the many, many people who are involved in this, all the many lawyers, all the many parties really come together and get it over the finishing line, which is a shame because the people in the U.S. suffering from substance abuse, they really need some help. And of course, as you know, we've offered to donate the use of Suboxone, which is a very good drug to wean people off opioid misuse. We've offered to donate the use for all of the U.S. for the next 10 years. So I would say the faster we get going, the better for people suffering from substance abuse. And I hope we'll see a final settlement within this year but I'm not optimistic about the timing right now. But Cor, are you saying that it's basically the court system's fault because it can't meet and that that's what's holding things up? And if not, can you not come to some kind of other arrangement with the court system? 
There's this tradition that, you know, when you have a multi-party litigation and you have a settlement framework that's ready to go, then in order to really finalize it and sign it, you have a lot of lawyers involved. You had a lot of plaintiffs. You had a lot of defendants. And in this case, you know, five companies, 50 states, lots of people involved. And to get the whole thing wrapped up, there needs to be some kind of time pressure. Right now, there is no real time pressure other than the fact that it would be a good idea to wrap it all up. But there's no legal pressure simply due to the fact that all the trials that were pending have been delayed due to COVID-19. Right, but it does sound like the solution you're proposing would help a lot of people in the meantime and COVID-19 is making their situation worse. What about the other uh, problem with the attorneys general and the generic price fixing? Where is that and where, where does that stand right now? Yeah, so that's correct. We have a criminal investigation ongoing with the DOJ. It's a situation where we see that we have not committed any crime, we have not organized any price fixing, we have not organized any cartel. So uh, we are in negotiations and discussions with DOJ. Hopefully we can reach a solution that everybody can be satisfied with. Uh, it is, of course, a risk that we can't, and with that case, we might go to trial. But so obviously there's absolutely no date settled for that then yet either. You're just waiting for the court system to get back up and running on that too, I guess, Cor. So the final question that I wanted to ask you is that, you know, you're obviously contending with, you know, many, many supply chain issues around the world. And we've learned that the likes of Germany, for example, is really low on things like generics because India stopped exporting generics. What kind of effect have you seen on your business from that action by India to stop exporting generics? We have seen a, a lot of different hurdles uh, in all markets and from basically all angles. But I think we've been able to overcome them all. And we actually have very steady supplies coming out of India and all other markets. So our uh, supply chain is actually fully intact right now. And uh, we don't have any supply problems in, uh, in Germany, as you mentioned. So we are very happy about it. But it has been and it continues to be a very challenging environment and you have to adjust every week, every day, and you have to secure that authorities in all countries understand how important it is for patients that you keep the value chain moving and you keep products moving around the world. But so far, we are very happy about the results that we are achieving.